Okay, showtime. Thanks, Bambi. Um, my job today is to introduce you a very, very good top Southern California entrepreneur, Scott Painter, the CEO of TrueCar. TrueCar is a well-known company here in Southern California, having raised well over $300 million in equity and debt, uh, employs approximately 400 people, and has a market value in the approximately billion-dollar range right now. It is clearly one of the better internet companies in our region. In the case of TrueCar's business model, it is, to use the overused VC room word, one of my favorites, truly disruptive. It is truly, truly disruptive to one of the largest U.S. industries, the automobile industry, in this case, online auto retail. I was the original investor in TrueCar. You could say I took a proven entrepreneur in Scott Painter and backed him, pretty simple. Like all entrepreneurs, like Scott and myself, we have had our fair share of ups and downs. When I met Scott to discuss what would become True Car, uh, I don't think, but I actually mean I know, no one would back Scott Painter. Probably many people wouldn't even listen to his idea at the time. But I knew something different in sizing up Scott Painter and in talking about his dreams and plans to build a multi-billion dollar company. The strengths I saw in Scott Painter really define what it is to be an entrepreneur, which is why we're all here today. He was someone who was dealing with adversity in leaving his first company, a pretty hot company called Cars Direct, so Scott Painter could deal with adversity. He also showed amazing vision from where he was going at the time with nothing behind him in internet auto retailing, basically looking five to six years before anybody else was looking there. I also saw an opportunity to invest in the driver, the leader. Scott Painter is clearly a leader. Finally, I got the opportunity to invest in an entrepreneur who has shown tremendous persistence in everything he does and stay to it in this. His skills and sheer will has kept True Car going, kept True Car from going out of business many times. A winner is a winner is a winner, and that is Scott Painter, who you're going to hear from today. Back when funding True Car, Scott Painter was known as a serious salesman, a big time fundraiser, they're all true, and someone who had a reputation actually who could not operate a business. I knew differently and most importantly, Scott Painter knew differently. He has proven himself to be an operational leader of a several hundred million dollar revenue company who steadies the ship as, elite, as leaders always do. Today, True Car has survived its many challenges, and Scott Painter and his team are the reasons why. All of you will witness the company's ultimate IPO, and hopefully our firm's great returns as a result. You will enjoy hearing from him. Once again, I'm honored to introduce you to Scott Painter, founder of True Car. Well, I, uh, I met with Bill this afternoon, and I, I have to admit, it's the first time I've ever seen Bill actually prepare for anything. So I, I, know, I know he took notes and we talked about uh, me, but Bill knows me better than most just about anybody. So it's an honor to be introduced by him. Uh, he was our first backer at True Car. I think Bill's also one of the real uh, sort of real early backers of Southern California. Um, so f first of all, before I get started, I want to thank Bambi and, and the whole Vader team. Uh, I think you guys coming to Southern California last year and making this a bigger deal uh, certainly helps to create a, a, a greater buzz here. Um, there's a lot of things happening in Southern California. And there's, a, there's a, you know, sort of a negative bias that always comes with being a Southern California entrepreneur that you don't have any tech cred. So it's nice to see a lot of technology companies and a lot of events like this. Um, I tend to speak at a lot of uh, colleges and, and entrepreneur classes, and so a lot of the things that I end up talking about are, you know, how did you overcome adversity? How did you raise your first dollar? What would you advise for me to do? And uh, while that might be super interesting, I, I certainly don't want to uh, dig into that tonight. I think that there, there's two phases as an entrepreneur, and so for me personally, 
I've had a pretty interesting couple of years. Uh, TrueCar for me has been a seven year effort and uh, that's my longest uh, stint running anything or doing anything. I'm a, uh, I'm a multiple time college dropout, uh, have, have not finished a lot of stuff, um, and I've had 37 incorporations um, and uh, I, I, I've been told that that's not a good stat. Um, but but I, I think you know, the, the things that you would love to impart to an entrepreneur who's getting started um, sort of are pretty simple things. And so I'll spend two minutes on that and then I'll spend the rest of uh, my ta time talking about really sort of what's going on for me as an entrepreneur at this point in my career. And, and it's actually really sort of humbling because uh, Bambi had asked that I speak a little bit about adversity and how you overcome adversity. And certainly there's a lot of that when you're a young entrepreneur. You've got to figure out how to be uh, a fundraiser, a visionary. Uh, you've got to be completely persistent. You've got to have great competence. Um, when I speak at these uh, you know, universities to the entrepreneur programs, most of the times what I talk about are the things that I just never see um, when entrepreneurs traditionally come and sit with me, which is most young entrepreneurs don't know how to read a balance sheet, a statement of cash flow, or an income statement competently, which is astonishing. Um, I, I think that should be a requirement of going to business school. Uh, but the idea of fundraising and starting a company without being able to be conversant in the financial lexicon of fundraising is absurd. Uh, I don't think we teach our young entrepreneurs nearly enough about the law. They don't know about a stock common purchase agreement, protective provisions, liquidation preference, all the things you need to be able to navigate in order to actually raise money. And acknowledging that fundraising is well over 50% of the success fa factor in an early stage company is, is absolutely true. Um, you've got to be able to raise money. And, uh, to Bill's introduction, my reputation was as a great fundraiser. Um, I've raised about $1.7 billion in debt and equity. So objectively speaking, that makes me uh, a great fundraiser. Uh, that is a horrible, horrible stat uh, because the follow-on is, you know, what have you made everybody? Um, and I, I think that uh, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about really the inflection point in my life. Um, I now have four kids. Uh, I failed at my marriage, my first marriage. I was married for 16 years. My mom argued that that was a successful marriage. Um, but, but I can say that I failed at it because I was so focused on being that workaholic entrepreneur. And I think that one of the things that I would say, sort of given where I'm at, uh, the way to overcome adversity is to have balance. And uh, it isn't about just killing yourself. You do have to work smart. I'm always on, but I, I definitely consider being an entrepreneur to be a career. And uh, my, my dad, when I was young, gave me uh, that book, uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. And I thought about it, and I gave it back to him, and I said, wrong son. I'm going to bet everything. I'm not the guy who's going to you know, get wealth by saving my way to, to a, a fortune. I'm going to bet it every time. And I do bet it every time. Um, and it's partly because I think entrepreneurs in general have an optimism bias. Um, I heard a speech earlier this year at a conference about optimism bias, and I thought it was really powerful. Um, you know, we all have an optimism bias. Nobody gets married with the idea that there's a 50% likelihood you're going to get divorced, but that's the facts. Um, when you sit down and say, you know, 30% of us will have some form of cancer or, or terminal disease at some point in our lives. Um, that's not, that's not us, that's, you know, and, and you know, the, the idea that you're gonna achieve financial freedom. I think all entrepreneurs think they're gonna achieve financial freedom and only 10% really do. Um, so, you know, the role that optimism bias, I think, plays in being a great entrepreneur is a very big issue in terms of overcoming adversity. For my personal story, um, I, the last four years for me have been a really remarkable transformation. I went from uh, thinking about quantity of great ideas and how I could get those out there and really loving the process of ideation and solving big problems and really being intellectual about, you know, it's not just about making money, it's about being the smartest guy in the room and figuring out how to do it. And my reputation uh, when I first met Bill was definitely as a great promoter who could raise money, who understood those things that I pointed to in the beginning of the, the presentation. I knew how to read a balance sheet. I knew how to to talk in those terms and perhaps too well. 
Um, and I really wasn't a very good operator, but I did have the ability to say I'm going to surround myself with people who are great operators. Um, one of the things I've learned about who you surround yourself with, you also have to make sure you don't surround yourself with ambitious people who want to eat your lunch. Um, so you, you, you not only choose great operators, but you choose great operators who buy into what you're doing and want to be part of your vision as well, because if you can accomplish their dreams by having them accomplish yours, you're going to get a lot further. Um, on the operator side, I, I really admire Matt. Um, it's interesting hearing Matt speak. Uh, we're friends, but it's so clear he's an operator. I mean, the things he talks about are the, you know, the, the blocking and tackling that you need to incrementally improve your business. And I probably, uh, for the first time three or four years ago, started speaking about that. And we had this internal dashboard, and we would measure everything. And a lot of those things were very visual ways of managing the company for me. And today, I can honestly say that given some of the things that have happened in the business that I run day to day right now, that uh, I, I, I am an operator, but I'm a reluctant operator. I didn't choose to, to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go and operate this business. I'm much more comfortable uh, in my natural state just saying, here's the vision. Here's my passion. Here's what I understand. Um, of the companies that I've started, uh, over half of them have been in automotive. And you could argue that all of them are part of an evolutionary process that culminates in what we're doing today at TrueCar. Uh, today, TrueCar um, is really a company that focuses on people and process. And um, the, the key to success is the engagement of that senior team and really sort of pulling together. Um, we have an interesting story. When I was interviewed by uh, somebody from Vader yesterday, just sort of in preparation for this, the last conversation I had had with them was around us having raised a couple hundred million dollars in debt and equity, and it was, hey, how's it going? We'd like a quick update. And I think they thought it was going to be a two-minute conversation about just, you know, everything's going great and there's nothing negative to say. Could you please speak about adversity? And I said, well, then that's, that's the meat of the conversation. The last six months for us has sucked ass. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I'm going to tell you what happened. And, and I think uh, it's, not, it's not an early stage entrepreneur story at all. It is absolutely a growth company problem. And it is also about me personally saying, I don't want to be a startup entrepreneur anymore. I like the idea of being a startup uh, investor. I like, uh, I, I, there's certain parameters around why and how and when I would do that. Uh, but I do like operating the company that I'm operating because it really is about going out, accomplishing your vision, and being able to really make it matter. And, and we've been around for seven years. Um, I would argue that my entire career could be summed up in the quest for transforming how cars are sold. I think that it's a big problem. I think we all recognize it. I think it's very emotional. I think everybody understands the car problem, and we're frustrated by it, and we're intimidated by it. And I don't think it has to be that way. And that, I think that's the essence of a great company, where you say, you know what, we have a righteous mission that we want to transform a real problem. The problem is in automotive, there's a lot of vested interest that doesn't want to change. It works for a lot of people. And it's a, it's a huge category. When you take um, the car sales, both new and used, financing, leasing, insurance, maintenance, repair, refueling, trade-ins, accessories, all the things that go around it, it's a $4.7 trillion ecosystem just in the US. So it's a huge category, and it's got one where there's margin compression. Um, and there's certain words that, uh, just given industry pushback and things that we've been through, that I just don't say anymore. But the car is a mass produced thing. So the idea that you would go to a car dealership and you would pay a different price, all of you, for the same exact mass produced thing, and I'm avoiding uh, the word commodity, which I really don't get a lot of chances to say anymore. Um, but when, when you go into that dealership and you're trying to buy something that you can buy somewhere else, the idea that there's total opacity and you don't know what others paid and you don't know what's fair is the essence of the problem. And we saw an opportunity, and, and I've believed in this for a long time, but the technology is here where big data and a great brand that stands for truth and transparency can actually empower a first-time car buyer. The idea that you can go to a website and for absolutely no money and not re revealing your anonymity, you can find out what everyone else paid for the car that you're thinking about buying is the only thing that matters in terms of whether or not that's a fair price. And the auto industry has been dominated by companies that 
think they have the next greatest thing for you and everybody's trying to monetize as their, their, their top priority as opposed to solve a real problem, I feel. And so the, the real um, sort of proof point for us in TrueCar was, is there a business there, but does it really make a difference? And as an entrepreneur, you always know when your company gets traction because people you've never met come up and say, I used it and it worked, it was great. Or you saved me a lot of money or a lot of time or a lot of frustration. And those are always great things to hear. Um, early on, even at TrueCar, you would sit down with somebody at a cocktail party, they say, what do you do? And you would say, and 30 minutes later, they still don't know and they leave. Um, so I, I, can, I can honestly say that TrueCar has gotten to that point where I now don't have to explain it anymore. People are excited by it. They understand the idea of empowerment through big data and information. But it also completely levels the playing field because when you publish a baseline of true information, everyone has to react to it. And up to now, the names in the space, Kelly Blue Book and Edmonds and many others that have been around for a long time, are now in a really tough spot because they have not been historically publishing factual data. They have been publishing a subjective view of value. They're a trusted resource. They were market makers. Uh, Kelly Blue Book, for example, got started by a car dealer 85 years ago in Southern California. And everybody said, what would Les Kelly pay for a car? And then he started publishing it and selling the book to the other car dealers, and the car dealers started using it, and then everybody said they want to get their hands on it, and then it became a book, and then it became a web property. That's not big data telling you what you need to know about making a good decision. And so we had a very simple concept, which was can we empower people through data? And we then coupled that with a very, really interesting business model that said we only want to get paid if somebody ends up buying a car. And the notion that there is an evolutionary step from advertising being totally accountable uh, or not accountable to being totally accountable is really the, the subtext of everything that we're doing. Uh, dealers for many years have been spending a lot of money marketing to customers, and they simply didn't know what worked. Uh, Ten years ago, a dealer might have asked you, how did you hear about us? Was it the radio, the television? Did you read it in the classifieds? And, and that was how they would attribute sales. Then lead generation came along, and they got to buy the names of an interested in-market consumer. And today, that's no longer an indication of in-marketness to buy a car. And what we do is we charge a dealer when they sell a car, because we can track that introduction all the way through onto the other side. So all of that sounds wonderful. As a company, we've been around for seven years. We've been doubling in size every year. Uh, 2010 for us was about a uh, $36, $37 million a year. Uh, 2011 for us was about a $75 million a year. And towards the end of the last year, we ended up raising a large amount of money and deciding to go on television. And we partnered with Guthy Ranker, we ran these TV ads, and our volumes literally went through the roof. And it turns out that the business became so hyper-relevant that instead of being incremental to dealers, we became core. And what I mean by that is, at at our best, we had about 6,000 car dealers that were on our program, and they would agree to pay us $300 every time one of our introductions bought a car. And that represents about a 50% savings versus what they traditionally spend. We always believed that if we were about 10% of a car dealer's total volume, that we would get their attention, and we were always fighting internally for relevance at the dealership. And we went from, on average, 10% to post-advertising in some markets as high as 50%. So 50% of all the cars they sold were coming through our program. And we've got two channels. We run the auto buying program not only for TrueCar.com, but we also now run it for Yahoo for um, uh, a whole number of open market sites, over 120 different affinity sites like USAA, AAA, Consumer Reports, American Express, and over 1,000 different employers that offer auto buying to their, to their customer or their members. And so we've just got a, a very large installed base. At the end of the year, we got to nearly 35,000 car sales over a trailing 30-day period at $300 per transaction, and the business was going to the moon. So uh, you can imagine all the attention that comes with that. People want to buy you. They want to give you money. They want to loan you dollars on almost no margin. I mean, it was just amazing where we were at as a business. Then it happened for us. 
we started getting pushback from the industry because we were no longer core, or no longer incremental, we were core. And so what is a skinny deal for a dealer in terms of margin on 10% of their volume because USAA customers are nice or American Express customers are nice became, wow, 50% of my car sales are being really reduced in margin. And we, we would have listed this in a risk factor if we were gonna go public. Um, Unfortunately for us, I've been out raising money, and in a modern fundraising world, all of that's on video. This will be on video. It'll be out there, I'm sure. Um, I've got a body of work that is pretty offensive to car dealers. Um, I was the guy who said car dealers should die. I think there were literally an economist, a USA Today, and a Wall Street Journal, sto Wall Street Journal story over a four year period, they all had the same exact title, the death of the salesman, it seemed so clever. Um, and that, that was my reputation, that was the company's reputation, that we didn't like salesmen, we thought that the entire way cars were gonna be sold was going to shift and that price distribution would narrow and the free market would find this supply demand inflection point, the theory was awesome, and a big idea. Um, we went from nearly 6,000 dealers to nearly 3,000 dealers in 60 days. Um, we had no idea they would rally because we, all, we always thought if, you know, you've got 65 Toyota dealers in Southern California, um, they hate each other more than just about anybody else. I mean, the Toyota dealers don't like the other Toyota dealers. They don't have a Toyota dealer family picnic and uh, they, they want to eat each other's lunch. And so we thought it was a fragmented industry that really wouldn't rally. And they did rally. Um, they did rally. And the reason they rallied in retrospect as a data company is really evident. We didn't know it at the time, but prior to November of last year when we went on TV, the average dealer on our network was engaging with our pricing tools about one out of uh, every 30 days. That shifted in a 30 day period to on average six to seven times a day. And there's good and bad in that. Uh, the, the good in that is that we're all of a sudden being taken very seriously. Uh, we're a market driver and we're setting the market clearing price. But the downside was that of the four million cars that were sold on the new car side from January to the end of March in uh, this last year, we drove just under 100,000 of those transactions and half of them were at a factual loss to the dealer. So if you bought a car from True Car this last year, you probably got a great deal. Um, but we heard from the industry. And there's something that is an astonishing fact that the customer is always right. Um, and you, you never should forget that. Uh, in our business, even though we sort of made the dealer the bad guy, because everybody immediately and intuitively and emotionally feels that, turns out the dealers are actually a pretty essential part of our ecosystem. Not all dealers, but definitely the dealers on our network. And so. The idea that dealers would boycott us, not pay their bills, talk ill of us when a customer came in, find ways to up the interest rate or lower the allowance on the trade-in as a way of making up for that offset lost revenue, while all the while wanting to kill TrueCar uh, was a new reality for us. And so I, I found that we went from a company that was very profitable, um, it's about a 40% net margin business, 85% gross margin business, hyper growth, to we lost almost $10 million in January, and that is a problem very fast. Um, it's very cool running a profitable company, by the way, very uncool to have run a profitable company that then becomes unprofitable. 30% uh, of my day became existing shareholders saying, what the hell's going on? Um, but more importantly, I had to go out and meet, meet our customers, meet all, all of the different constituents. The, the easiest way to understand how it's affected me, I've lost 38 pounds. So, so those of you who know me, uh, Thanksgiving, I weighed 224. Um, I, I'm now 38 pounds lighter. Everybody's worried about my health. I feel, feel pretty good. Um, it's not a diet that I would recommend at all. Um, but it really focused one thing that, that I think is important, and that is there's nobody who could have turned the company around. If we were being led by money, if the venture backers who had put the dollars into the company didn't stick with me as an entrepreneur, TrueCar wouldn't exist today. And the reality is, is because TrueCar was suffering, in fact, a genuine boycott. And what they wanted to hear 
is a reckoning, and they wanted to hear that we understood the issues, and we had to reevaluate our business. We changed our business model, how we build dealers, we changed our product, and we fundamentally changed how we relate to dealers, and we also changed a lot of folks in our management team to really be more responsive to the industry. And had we not done that, we would, we would still be causing the same types of problems that led us to where we are. Um, at my peak, I was getting over 2,000 emails a day, couldn't handle it anymore, literally hired an assistant to do nothing but separate the emails into causes and symptoms. Symptoms I couldn't deal with, causes I could, and we focused on changing the dealer tools, changing the information that they saw. If a customer had gone to our website for the first time, car buyer, and said, wow, you know, Prius, package two in LA, a great deal is 21.5. If you were a dealer on our website, we would say, we've got 15 Toyota dealers on the program out of 65 in Southern California. The lowest price is 19.5. Would you like to beat it? And they would. And so the psychology we created, even though we're not a reverse auction, was a psychology of a race to the bottom. So we had to stop that. And we have completely reinvented the business. It's cost us probably $30 million. We're not yet out of that hole. But today, we are about 30% off of our lows, rebounding in every key metric in the business. Um, to Bill's point, I am an operator now. Um, that is exactly how we're going to get out of this. To Matt's point, it's about those 10% improvements on all of those key operating metrics and fundamentals across the board for us. And I think that um, if you ever want to have an anxiety-driven moment, um, Take a company that is supposed to be on the brink of an IPO and looking to get sold and everything's going well and have it completely turn upside down inside of 60 days. It's absolutely terrifying. Everything you think about anything is completely wrong. And um, I, I can tell you that where we stand today has everything to do with team and it has everything to do with the support of our shareholders and it starts with guys like Bill Woodward, who literally just said, we're betting on the entrepreneur. Um, the reality is we have a, a deep understanding of our business, but it wouldn't have been possible if we didn't transform from being a startup that was ambitious and disruptive to being a startup that can still be disruptive, but needs to be focused on the needs of that customer. So we, we do that today. Um, we also raised money in the midst of all that, which is also proof of, I think, a whole bunch of things that reaffirm everybody's uh, commitment to the business. And, and uh, it's a really interesting time to be at Vader for us as a company. Um, I think we are set for one of the biggest sort of rebounds. I think it is a rite of passage for us, and it's how we come out of this as a dominant company that is winning in our space. We have a unique business model, and we own this. Nobody wants to walk the fire that we just walked through. Um, but for me as a CEO, it's a completely different set of challenges than the startup CEO. Um, and uh, I, I would say that it all comes down to that operating discipline. I'm happy to answer questions. I got three minutes left, and I'm not going to let that guy sing me off the stage. <laughs> so. uh, it sounds like you guys are obviously a maker of your own success in disrupting an industry. I'm sorry. It uh, sounds like you guys were uh, obviously a victim of your own success in disrupting the industry. Can you elaborate at all on how you are becoming less disruptive to that industry or uh, creating more amicable terms for them? I, I don't think we're less disruptive. I think that we are going to be more disruptive in, in a lot of ways. I think that um, there was a lot of miscommunication. I didn't spend a lot of time on the road. I didn't spend a lot of time getting to know dealers. Um, I should have done that. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of things I learned personally about what it takes to operate a business versus promote and find investors. I was so centri centric on you know, the team and recruiting and fundraising that I really wasn't out in the field getting to know our customers. And I wasn't a great manager like I should have been. And I think that we've gotten that religion for sure. And I've, I've spent so much time on the road now. And you know, our top customers, I've seen two, three, four times this year. Um, I can also say that for us, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. Um, we're not about the low, low price. We're not the Walmart of cars. That was never the goal. It was about honesty, truth, and transparency. And the car industry, I believe, has it totally wrong in the sense that almost every ad you see is about saving an extra $1,000, come on down. And in our world, we believe that fear is a much more powerful motivator from a marketing point of view than greed. 
And it's really about not getting taken advantage of. And the idea that you can actually make a good empowered decision that's very wise is much more powerful in terms of getting to an in-market shopper. Uh, we see 30, 40% conversion rates, lead gen sees two. So I think that from a, it is a transactional model that's focused on the psychology of a customer opting in based on seeing a price first, better, there's no question. Uh, today we monetize it nearly still six fifty to seven dollars per unique visitor, which is absolutely astonishing. So the business model is great. We just have to really focus on communicating better to the dealer and embracing them and letting them know we are their partner. And I think they just didn't feel that way before. I'll say uh, thank you because I read on one of your websites you publish white pages. Yes. Yeah. And I think they're brilliant. They've inspired me in many ways, and I think if everybody in this room read your white pages, they would have a, a clear idea of how to truly disrupt industries. So thanks. Thanks. Uh, I, I will tell you, the white papers for us, I used to spend hours in meetings with first-time people, hours. It was like 101 about our business, and then we published the white papers, which is excruciatingly hard to get it right. Um, and then all of a sudden, everybody who started meeting with us had read the white papers, and they came in, and we could actually start talking about real stuff. So that was a really really uh, helpful move for us and a, and, a, and a hard one to do, so thanks. One more. Yes, having gone through everything that you've gone through over the last eight months or so, if you could go back to pre your uh, television advertising campaign, would you change anything or would you run the same course? I'd change everything and do exactly what we did in response to all the problems that we faced. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I, I wish we would have been uh, more focused on compliance. I wish we would have done all of the product things. I mean, internally, we knew we were a, a couple of years ahead on vision to reality on the product side. So product velocity has become a very big issue for us. Um, compliance has made that a mandatory issue. And we're back in terms of that product velocity today. Uh, we would have focused a much higher priority on the dealer as a customer, not advantaging the dealer, but just giving them information. We were sort of Google Analytics without the analytics. We just didn't give the dealers what they needed to actually price the car to retain margin. We told them what they needed to do to beat the other guy. And in a lot of ways, what it means is that all the dealers prior to November of last year that were thriving on our program were already good dealers. They were already low price competitive dealers. The dealers that are thriving on our program today are using TrueCar as a market-based tool to understand where is the inflection point between a good and a great price and, and margin retention and selling the customer. And that's a really interesting economic reality around the whole, the, the theory of supply and demand that's very real now that wasn't before. So I, I think that you know, we didn't know what we didn't know before. We responded and it's cost us a lot, but I think we, I think we survive and win in our space. Cool. Thank you Thank so you. much. That was such a candid speech, thank you.